Hey, boaters, it's Thursday night. It's Jim from Ray Marine, and this is Ray Marine Live. Thank you for coming out tonight and joining us. We have a pretty cool show with some awesome technology to show you tonight. We're going to be talking about some of the new Sirius XM marine weather features that we released in our Axiom uh, Lighthouse 4 update. So I know a lot of you have been updating to Lighthouse 4, and I've gotten a lot of great uh, comments and questions about it, and definitely uh, keep that uh, feedback coming as well. So if you see something you really like, let us know. If you see something you don't like, let us know about that too, because uh, we are always looking to improve and change things around and make a better experience for you. Uh, so I do have a guest tonight. We'll bring him in in just a second. Uh, but as we get going here, uh, let me just kind of go through some of the housekeeping stuff that I always forget to do at the start of the episode. So I know a lot of you are watching tonight on YouTube and Facebook and maybe a few people on Twitter as well. We added that into our stream for this week. We'll see how that works out. Uh, but certainly feel free to drop your questions and comments uh, into the stream. We'll pause periodically to take those questions. I also want to encourage you to, if you are watching this after the live stream and you're watching the recording, uh, feel free to drop your questions and comments into the stream on whatever platform you're watching on as well. Um, I'll be back in there tomorrow and for the next several days and weeks, and I'll continue to answer questions and, uh, and take feedback uh, that way. Um, I do want to make sure that everybody gets their questions answered, uh, so we'll take as many as we can live, and then I will follow up separately with anybody that needs help that way. All right, so let's bring in our guest tonight. Joining us is Dan Dickerson from Sirius XM Radio. How are you tonight, Dan? I'm very well, sir. Good evening, everyone. Excellent. Thank you for coming out and joining us. So we are going to be talking about uh, the Sirius XM uh, marine weather uh, system. Um, and it's got quite a lot of capability on Axiom. So for many, many years, we have had the basic weather uh, program and with our latest update, we have now added fish mapping, which is a pretty cool tool for coastal anglers. Um, and I understand you have quite a lot of experience with that system out on the water. I have. It's been been fun. I was involved in the development process from the very beginning um, and uh, have some practical time uh, and uh, am really excited about how it's come to fruition. Yeah, it's pretty cool. There's really some neat stuff in there. Um, so I think to start off, what I want to show everybody is the hardware that actually makes this system all work. So I have uh, here on the desk, this is an SR200 uh, Sirius XM receiver unit. So you can see it's pretty small, um, uh, very compact, and it's got four connections on the bottom of it. So let's kind of talk about uh, what comes in the box with this. So this is your receiver. Um, you have a connection for an antenna, which is this little guy right here. Um, and the kit actually comes with a Shakespeare Galaxy SRA50 Sirius XM antenna in the box. Um, it's actually a four-way antenna. It's kind of a cool setup. You can mount just the antenna unit itself, um, flush mounted on a surface. Um, you can use the top of this mount as a standoff for a top-down installation. Um, you can use the first two tiers of this mount and then pole mount it, uh, or it also comes with this uh, base as well so that you can screw it into a surface. So a lot of flexibility with this system. And then also included in that kit is the cable to tie it together. So here's the cable. It is 25 feet long. Um, and if you need to go longer with this cable, uh, Shakespeare does make longer cable sets for this. So they are available as an accessory, um, but that's the antenna system. Um, the next port on the bottom here is an audio port. So for anybody um, not familiar, and I don't imagine there is anybody that hasn't heard of Sirius XM yet, uh, but they are a, a satellite radio service as well. So this device can pick up the, uh, the audio broadcast. Um, this port here um, actually has a left and right uh, stereo output cable. Um, and what's kind of cool about this is you could actually take this uh, cord, plug this right into an amp and some speakers, and then you can control the music uh, and audio portion of Sirius XM right from your Axiom uh, MFD. Um, and of course, you can subscribe and get all the different you know mu music and sports and news and talk uh, that they have to offer that can be added on to any of their subscription packages. Um, this is a network cable. This is a Raynet high-speed connection. Um, the cable comes in the box. It's a three-meter long uh, cable. Um, one thing I will say to make note of if you're installing one of these, um, this network cable is particular to this SR200. 
Um, the network cable has a standard Raymarine Raynet connector on one end, uh, but the Sirius SR200 uh, end of it uh, is specific to this uh, box. So don't lose track of this cable. You need this one to connect the SR200 into the Raymarine network, but it is included in the kit. Um, and then the last one is the power cable. And this is what it looks like. Pretty standard uh, power cable. Uh, looks like this is also about three meters long. Uh, you got a fuse connection here. Um, it has some banana plugs on the end of it because this is the one off of my workbench. So when you get yours, it won't have the banana plugs on the end, but you'll be able to tie this right into your boat's 12 volt system uh, to power up the uh, SR200 receiver. So that's the, the hardware that, that makes it happen. Now, um, these are all subscription services, right, Dan? Yes, sir. So um, what is kind of the basic level service that someone can get on one of these? Right. With the Raymarine system, there are uh, basically three tiers of weather available. There's one we call the coastal package. There's one called the offshore package. And then there's the fish mapping package. And in regards to the coastal and offshore, uh, the, the coastal and offshore, those are just names. They don't have a real true geographic reference. Okay. Um, so, you know, I often get questions from someone in the Great Lakes, will the coast or coastal package work or will the offshore package? And the answer is yes, it will. Um, it will have all the, the weather features available on the Great Lakes as well as on the coast. Um, for somebody heading offshore, uh, the coastal package will give them all of our current weather conditions, uh, no matter how far offshore you get, as long as you're within our coverage area, which is up to about 150, 200 miles offshore. I have customers all the way, all over the Bahamas using the service. Uh, the, the satellite footprint even lobes out. So you get service out as far as Bermuda. I was really impressed by that. Yeah. I was checking out the, the graphic that you guys have online that shows the, how far it goes. And uh, it's, it's actually really shocking how far it goes. I didn't think it went right. that far. It's not a global system. Our satellites are geostationary, so they do hover over North America at all times. Um, a lot of people, you know, think satellite, they think global, but this is not. It is It is definitely uh, limited, but it has, like you said, a, a pretty good range. Uh, so the difference between the coastal and offshore packages is the, uh, the offshore package includes extra forecasting information. We figure somebody running offshore not only wants the current weather conditions, but they want to see what, what's going to be happening uh, up to 48 hours in advance. And we have mm -hmm. a, a specialized marine computer model for all the sea conditions that are part of that offshore package. Yeah, that uh, makes a lot and, of sense. Like a lot of people running offshore are going to be making overnight runs or they might even be staying out for a couple of days at a time. Right. And, and so it just builds on the coastal package. And then you have the fish mapping package, which includes all of the weather that is in the offshore, plus the additional fish mapping features. Uh, and then we have the audio packages. There are several audio packages. Uh, and our two uh, most common package, the first one is called music and entertainment. Normally, it's about uh, $17 a month. And then there is our platinum package, which is about $22 a month. Those are both discounted if you have subscribed to the weather service as well. Okay. Uh, so it takes the music and entertainment package down to about $12.99 a month and the uh, platinum package to $16.99 per month. Okay. So you get about a 30% yeah, price break when, you, when you're subscribed to the weather and you add an audio package. Not too bad. So I know a lot of our viewers, um, a lot of them are from down south where they get to vote year round. Um, but up here in my neck of the woods, um, we're in New Hampshire. Um, you know, our boating season basically starts, you know, May 1st for the very bold. And it ends probably October 1st, uh, aside from the very bold people that keep going. Um, what, do you have to keep this running year round or can you? Yeah, no, thank you for asking. You, you don't. Um, we have a way to suspend service. Uh, it's very, very easy. Um, and, and you can be subscribed on monthly billing or you can be on annual billing. It doesn't matter if you're putting the boat on the hard for the winter. Just call us and say you'd like to suspend your service. When you use the word suspend instead of the word cancel, then what we do is we basically take your, your service and stop it. Um, and anything that you've paid us that you haven't used, say it's on a monthly billing and you've got two weeks left in the month, uh, those two weeks go into escrow. And when, when you suspend, we ask you when you want it turned back on and you can set that date up to six months out. So it will turn back on automatically and there's no fee when it comes back on. So you're not having to pay a reactivation fee. It just makes the whole process a lot simpler to be able yeah, to suspend. Great. And you can, as I said, you can suspend up to six months. All right. Well, that is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely convenient for people that can't use it year round. Um, and of course, uh, everybody down south that gets to boat year round, all of us are are envious. 
Well, uh, let's take a look at the product itself. So we're going to actually bring up my uh, my gigantic axiom here. Uh, we probably want to go to that three-way split, and we'll bring it up really large. So we are uh, we're looking at the um, this is actually the weather um, mode on the chart. So all of the Sirius XM data is part of the chart app on any Axiom display. So just to show you how to get in here in the first place, I'm gonna go out to the home screen. Um, and I set up a few different pages, a um, few different variations of the chart. Um, and this is something that sometimes comes in handy if you have different bits of information and you like to display it different ways. Um, so this tile is a chart app, but I set it to come up in the weather mode by default. And the way that I do that is over here in the Axiom main menu. This is my mode selector. I have my simple and detailed, my fishing chart, my anchor mode, and here is weather. So this is Sirius XM weather. Um, so you can see the weather overlay drops right in on top. And I have a bunch of different things going on here. I have uh, some storm track data for a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. And I should say that this is pre-recorded data. This is our simulated loop. So this is not real. Uh, so anybody down there in the Gulf or in uh, Western Florida, uh, don't get alarmed by this. Um, some other layers I have turned on here. I have some sea surface temperature. Uh, I have some storm uh, track data uh, turned on. We have weather radar, some surface fronts. So a lot of different uh, information is available. And it's all actually organized right in this menu here called weather layers. Um, and when you come in here, it lays them all out layer by layer. Uh, with toggle switches to turn them on and turn them off. Uh, certain layers also have adjustable transparency. So for example, the weather radar or the sea surface temperature, uh, we have some transparency controls in here. So you can uh, darken it up or you can lighten it up and that allows you to see uh, layers underneath, um, in this case, sea surface temperature or uh, weather radar. Oh, so for those of you who have been using Sirius XM uh, in the past, um, we have added a couple of new things in Lighthouse 4 that I wanted to show you. I think these are going to be helpful to you. Um, I'm going to go down here to the settings menu. And we added uh, this tab called subscription. And there's quite a lot going on on this page now. This is all new. Um, so the first thing I want to direct you to is this giant table uh, in here. And what this does is it kind of catalogs all of the pieces of weather information that are coming down from the satellite. So it tells you... Um, what data types it has received, uh, the time uh, that it was last updated, and how long ago uh, that was. So you can see 20 minutes ago, I got an update of CloudTop layer. Um, back at uh, noon, I got a high-res forecast with wind direction. I got lightning strikes back at 12.55, 20 minutes ago. Um, so this is kind of a cool way to see if you are actually receiving data. I know sometimes people come down to the boat, they fire everything up, and they wonder, this thing working? Am I seeing anything? I'm not sure. Um, this is a way to actually tell if there is data flowing into your system. And sometimes it does take a few minutes for things to appear on the screen. Um, a couple of other things that are over here that come in handy. There is a signal strength uh, indicator. You got one, two, or three bars. That is the strength of the serious signal off the satellite. Um, we have um, in a Indication here for the receiver ESN. So mine's a simulator, but normally there'd be um, a code there. Uh, Dan, can you tell me a little bit like, what is that ESN and what do you guys use it for? Yeah, that, that ESN, that's like the phone number for the Sirius XM receiver. That's the number that you need to give us when you call to subscribe. And that's the number that we send information to. So if you subscribe to the offshore package, then we're going to send a signal to that number saying that it is authorized to basically unlock the offshore package for the user. Okay. Yeah, so that ESN, if you ever uh, have to interact uh, with Sirius XM or even with Raymarine tech support, we may have you go and look for that. Uh, and that's where you find it, right there on the subscription uh, tab. Um, the other thing that's new in here too is we actually have uh, flags uh, for subscription status. Um, this being the simulator on the system, um, it's actually missing one. So there is supposed to be flags in there for uh, both weather and fish mapping. And it will say whether you're subscribed or unsubscribed, um, but that's out here on the sidebar. Um, another thing I wanted to point out that is new is um, this big block down here on the corner. Um, so we have added um, a legend um, that helps to describe the different layers of information that you're seeing uh, on the chart. 
So for example, I have the sea surface temperature layer turned on. And what this is showing me is that anything at the blue end of the scale is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything at the high end of the scale is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're looking for a particular uh, swath of water that you want to fish, or maybe you're cruising from Florida up to the north or from the north to the south, and you're trying to either get in or out of the Gulf Stream, um, you can actually use the sea surface temperature to see uh, where that current is. The Gulf Stream is always full of very warm water, usually surrounded by cold water. So we can um, we can actually pull it out of the sea surface temperature overlay by constraining uh, the temperature. So you can see right now I have the temperature constraints turned on. Um, this little indicator down here that says limits on uh, tells me that I have limited um, my temperature overlay. So if I come up here into the menu, I have uh, this new item here, weather display limits. And sea surface temperature right now is constrained. My upper limit is 80, my lower limit is 70. But just to show what it does, if I turn it off, there is all of the information. I'm gonna turn it back on and let's uh, let's change the lower limit a little bit. Let's bring some of the colder water back in. So you can see out there on the live view chart, it updates in real time as I start adding the colder water back in. And I can do the same on the other side. Let's uh, see if there's any warmer water. And of course there is. Um, so you can see how you can use that to really uh, hone in on a particular area of interest um, in that sea surface temperature overlay. So that is something new that we introduced with Lighthouse 4. Um, let's pause for a second and take a look at the questions. I see just a few of them in there. And if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the stream. Uh, but we'll pull a few of these up and see what we got so far. So Christian is going to start us off tonight. How do we get two hour long episodes? Well, uh, I'm going to send you to the playlist on YouTube for that one. I don't know if I can hold out for two hours. I can talk for a long time, but uh, maybe not that much. Um, let's see. Does Raymarine offer any beta testing to users? Um, that is an awesome question, Christian. And the answer to that is yes. We do have a pretty active uh, beta testing uh, group. We do recruit uh, end users, boaters, real people that use our products to be beta testers for us. Um, if that is something you are interested in, um, I can actually put you in touch with our uh, beta testing organizer. Um, they do have a pretty rigorous um, battery of questions they're going to ask you. I will say that beta testing is not for the faint of heart. Um, you will get some extremely buggy software that will blow up at the most inopportune times during beta testing, and it gets better and better and better as it gets close to release. Uh, but if you're up for the challenge, yes, that is something we have. Um, you can certainly uh, drop a comment in or, or send me an email, james.mcgowan at remarine.com. I can put you in touch with the team. What else have we got in here, Mr. Producer Man? From Dean. He has a system with three Axiom Pros, an AIS 5000, a FLIR, et cetera. Is it acceptable to power these down by removing the DC power instead of power buttons on the displays? Uh, yes, sir, you can. So um, all of the displays have power buttons. And if you wanted to, you could go display by display and turn everything off. Um, or you can just cut the main power to all of them and, and shut them off that way. Um, it is actually not going to hurt them. We designed them to do that. Um, if you do shut them off from the main power switch, then when the power is reapplied, they will come back on automatically. Uh, so um, you can do that. That's no problem at all, Dean. Let's see if we can get one more in here from Mac. Is this in the USA only? I'm guessing he is in the UK from his comment. So Dan, how far does this reach? Yeah, no, we, we kind of covered that already. It, it, unfortunately, we're not able, able to offer service in the UK. Only yeah. only U.S. and up to about 200 miles off the contiguous U.S. All right. Yeah. So, Mac, if you do um, if you do come over this way on vacation, come to Florida, sign up <laughs> for a fishing charter. Uh, we can get you out on a boat yeah. for sure and get you on some fish. I um, will say, you you know, you can buy just one month of service. A lot of people don't realize that. But if you're you know, if you're a really short term boater, um, you, you're, you're not required. If you're coming over here on vacation or something like that, you don't have to buy an annual plan. There's no contract required. Yeah, I think uh, technically, too, if I'm not mistaken, you guys have a trial offer, too, don't you? There are trials available for most things. Absolutely. Yes. And and uh, actually, if you do buy a month of service and you only use it two weeks, it's prorated. We give you the two weeks that you don't that you don't use back when you stop the service. Mm, pretty good. That's pretty reasonable. All right. Uh, let's see. Maybe we get one more there. What's that next question down? I think that was an antenna question. Can you split your other serious antenna for stereo use for this new device versus installing another antenna? Can you talk to that, Dan? 
I can. Yes, you can. Shakespeare actually makes a splitter or um, you can go out. There's a there's a pretty good website called MyRadioStore.com that sells a lot of Sirius XM parts, compatible parts, and you can get a splitter and all the cables required. So one antenna will drive uh, both your audio receiver and your Raymarine receiver. That's not true of all brands, but it is for Raymarine. All right. Yeah, so that's definitely convenient. Use that antenna for more than one thing. Um, you know, another question too, because um, for example, the fish mapping we, we said actually needs this SR200, but there might be customers out there that have a prior generation. Maybe they have an SR150 or even the old SR6 or whatever. Um, is the antenna the same? Can that yes. be reused? Yes. The older systems would have used a Shakespeare SRA40, uh, but even that antenna is still compatible. Typically, okay. when somebody installs a new system, I'll say, hey, save the new antenna as a spare. Uh, try your old one first. If you get three bars, signal strength showing up, then everything is good and use the antenna you've got. That's awesome. That can save a lot yeah. of work pulling cable. Even, even the connectors are the same. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, take a look back at the product again. We're going to bring the Axiom back up big on the screen. Oh, one more comment. Thank you for hosting these wonderful sessions. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm glad that you can uh, come out here on a Thursday night and give us an hour of your time. Um, so let's see here. So back on the Axiom display, um, what I want to show you are some more new controls that we put in, um, this time on the navigation chart. So we are in weather mode. Um, I'm going to shift this Axiom into its um, kind of normal navigation chart. Um, so up here, I'm going to close the menu just so I can show you where I'm going. So here we are in the chart app. I'm going to go up here to the menu on the top right corner. I'm going to go into my mode selection, and I'm going to go to detailed. The so detailed is what you would typically be in for uh, navigation. Um, this is going to give you all the full access to your Navionic data or Lighthouse chart or CMAP or whatever chart you like to run. Um, but we do have the ability to bring weather radar in on top of the navigation chart. We know a lot of people like to run with that weather radar on, especially down south where you get those pop-up thunderstorms and squalls and things like that. It's really handy to be able to see when those uh, systems develop and are headed in your direction. Um, and we have been able to show this in the past, though it was not necessarily as intuitive as it could be uh, for turning it on. So we made some improvements. Um, so down here in the settings menu, and we go to layers because weather radar is a layer that can be turned on or turned off. If I scroll down a little bit here, you're going to see a section called Sirius XM. And when I turn on the weather radar, uh, it is going to add that uh, to the chart. We have a little bit of a uh, what uh, here in Louisiana coming through. I think it's a little bit offshore here in Florida. I'll zoom in in just a second. Um, but there's the control to turn it on and off. Um, there's also a control here to adjust, again, that uh, visibility or transparency. Uh, right now it's at 70%, so I can partially see through the weather radar. And that might be important on a navigation chart where you're trying to look at nav aids and buoys and depth soundings and other things like that. You can add some transparency so that nothing is obscured. Uh, but if you need more detail, you can certainly crank this up uh, and make the weather uh, a lot more solid. Um, and it makes it pop out a little bit more on the chart. or at 90% there. Um, and I'm just going to close the menu. That's the full screen. And that should be in a bit. Kind of wide scale. So there's some weather radar dropped in on top of the navigation chart. And as I zoom in here, you're going to see that the Navionics data will begin to fill in when I get down to the range. That, that there we go. So there's live navigation chart with uh, weather radar dropped in on top. And this is at 90% um, transparency. Um, so you can see that it covers up some of the charts involved. You know, I wanted to lighten that up and you just go back in and use that control um, and make it easier to see. All right. Um, so in addition to what we have seen in the weather mode, we looked a little bit at weather radar. Um, there is tons of other information in there as well. There is lightning strike data. There is front. There is coastal forecast. There are city reports. Um, so huge amount of weather information available uh, in all those layers on the system. We're going to transition now and talk a little bit about uh, fish mapping, which is um, another tier of information um, that's available. So I set this window up to come up in fish mapping mode automatically. And I will show you how I did that. So this is my chart app. And then up here in the main menu, I just go to menu, 
And in my mode selector, you see I have a control for dish mapping. Uh, so when I turn that on, um, you'll notice that all of the controls here in the menu are now all related to dish mapping. Um, so let's talk um, a little bit about the different layers that are in here. So I'm going to go, I'm going to start with this one right here called fishing recommendations. And one of the really cool things that the Sirius XM team uh, provides on this is recommendations by oceanographers of where the bite is. Um, how often do they update this, Dan? Yeah, those updates occur on Tuesday mornings and Friday mornings only. There's a lot of work that goes into de determining this information, so it only is a, we're only able to put it out twice a week. And I just want to say that, that this information, it's based not based on catch reports at all. It's based strictly on science. The oceanographers are looking at the uh, conditions for those species. Um, each one of them has a specific recipe. They like a certain water temperature, a certain plankton concentration. And if all of the boxes get ticked, then we draw a circle and say X marks the spot for that particular species. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You can see it's very easy to use. Um, it's just, um, you know, the major species are uh, each have their own uh, color coded ellipses uh, on the chart. So you just turn on whatever species of fish you are after for that day, or you can just turn them all on. Um, when you have um, species uh, enabled, there is a legend out on the corner of the chart. So you can see the color codings for the fishing recommendations right here. So I have billfish, mahi, and tuna turned on, orange, green, and red, respectively. And again, if you want to change that around or look at something different, um, you can go right back into the menu, into the fishing recommendations, and, uh, and change that. Um, so out here on this legend, which is kind of similar to what we saw on the weather uh, side of the house, um, we have other types of information um, that can be layered onto the chart. Um, and they are described here in, um, in the legend uh, to kind of define their color coding. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this back up. I'm going to go into fish mapping layers. And I'm going to actually begin by turning off uh, some things. In fact, you know what? I'm going to turn off uh, fishing recommendations for a second just to declutter the screen a little bit. So I'm going to turn all of these off, 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 off. There we go. Back. And let's go to our layers. Okay. So I'm going to start with a clean screen. And let's take a look at what some of these layers are. So we're going to start up at the top. So 30 meter subsurface temperature. This is a rather interesting display because it is giving us, it looks like temperature um, isobars across the, the map. Um, so how, how do you get this kind of information, Dan? Where does this come from? Yeah, this this is based. Uh, this is coming from the company that we partnered with that gives is giving us all of this fish mapping information. That company is Maxar. They are the actual folks that have the oceanographers that are doing all this work, and they've been providing uh, fishing information data of this sort to the commercial fish, fishing industry for a couple of decades now. So they've been at it a while. And this is one of their key features that they have, uh, this 30 meter subsurface. What we're looking at is the temperature at 100 feet down. And it uses a software algorithm and other factors to determine what that temperature is at 100 feet. So we're able to see, just like you'd see surface temperature contours, you're seeing what the temperature is 100 feet down here. It's pretty impressive that they can uh, figure that out via satellite. You know, in the olden days, they'd have to send uh, a dude with a diving bell and a thermometer down. That's, that's right. That's right. Technology is more. Wonderful. It is a wonderful thing. And I guess the idea behind this is that a lot of those game fish, when they're hunting, they're actually deeper down in the water. They're not necessarily up at the surface. They're they, a they couple find of things. Temperature and they stay there. Yeah. Number one, finding the edge, for example, if you're looking for the edge of the Gulf Stream, being able to see the subsurface temperature as well as surface temperature is extremely helpful. Um, another area where we see it, uh, bringing in wonderful results is in Florida in the summertime, the surface water temperature is pretty much the same everywhere. It's at about 80 degrees. And even in your uh, simulation there that you had when you turned it on all, all, earlier, all you saw was orange everywhere, the same color. Um, being able to see a cooler spot at 100 feet is very advantageous to figure out you know, where the temperature is, a little, where there's a little bit of a change going on and where the bait fish are most likely to be. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how just that little change in conditions, you know, creates almost like a barrier or a barricade where the fish, they tend to 
pack up there. Well, every, every fish has a comfort zone. He's going to go where he's comfortable. And that's, you know, temperature has a lot to do with that. I guess that, that is true. Um, let's take a look at another layer. So I'm going to go back in here to our fish mapping layers. And for now, I'm going to turn off the 30 meter. And let's get this one. This one I find particularly interesting. This one's called a height anomaly. And from what I understand with this, they're using a satellite with radar on it. And they're taking actually measurements of the height of the ocean in different spots. What it's similar. Like yeah, it's similar to the same technology that's used for positioning with GPS. Basically, we're bouncing a microwave off the ocean surface. And uh, based on that return, they can uh, look and see what the ocean's height is. And the actual height of the ocean changes on a daily basis uh, in centimeters. And we're able to measure that height change in centimeters. So it's, it's sort of like tides, but this is out in the middle of the ocean, can be anywhere. And what we found is if the height is dropping, we refer to that as a downwelling. And it's like somebody flushed a toilet. There's not gonna be anything there because when the ocean height drops, it, it, it pushes everything out. Um, conversely, uh, with an upwelling where the, the ocean level has reached a low point and is starting to come back up, it brings all the nutrients from the bottom and the bottom water temperature, which is different, back up again. Um, and so we refer to those as upwellings and downwellings. It's a little counterintuitive. Um, a, an upwelling is going to be a negative number, and that's a good thing. You want to be on the negative numbers, or you want to be between the, the upwelling and the downwelling. If you get where those those contour lines that you're seeing on screen, where they get really close together when you get an upwelling next to a downwelling, that is what we refer to as a convergence zone. And a lot of times between an upwelling and a downwelling, you'll get a, a vertical current shaft. And again, that's where the bait fish, that's where, that's the comfort zone again. That's where they're going to go. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. I was noticing there's a pretty good spot just like right, right here in the simulation. You can see there's a here's a zero, a zero, and that means yeah. that that's that's basically zero means the the sea height is at its normal average level, the average level, and then you know below that or above that is going to be the 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 uh, the negatives and the positives. That's pretty so good. So yeah. zero is the convergence zone, but it's it only really makes a difference you, if you find a zero line in the middle of nowhere. That's not going to do you any good. It needs to be you know there need to be other water height changes nearby in order for this to be effective. Okay. Yep. They're looking for that, that change again, I guess that. Right. Where those lines get tight together. And I suppose the idea behind this too, is that if there's more than one of these boundaries stacked up nearby. So for example, if we had uh, a sea surface temperature boundary and a height anomaly and they aligned with one another, now our odds are going up. That this exactly right. You know, you got a bunch of tools in the tool belt here. You're going to use all of them. That's pretty cool. Um, let's take a look at a couple more that were coming up. I noticed these are both related to plankton. So one of them is plankton contour. Um, and then one of them is plankton fronts. And I think they're both different ways of sort of visualizing the same information. Um, the plankton contour, I think, is um, is that showing us like kind of sort of the uh, the amount of plankton in the water? Correct. Plankton contours is giving you the um, parts uh, uh, per, per mill, milliliters per m cubic meter. Um, okay. And and uh, milligrams, excuse me, milligrams per cubic meter. Um, so that is the actual plankton concentration. Um, again, that's based on satellite imagery, uh, the clarity of the water. Um, they're able to determine the plankton content. Um, so that's the, the plankton contours and where that's most going to be most effective is when you're fishing close to shore. Okay. Um, if you're, if you're, again, if you're going out, out after these pelagic species, then we want to start talking about plankton fronts. Plankton okay. fronts is a completely different product. Um, what it does is this is where the oceanographers get involved and apply their expertise. Um, so a plankton front is where the plankton is building up. So we're using the, the, the ocean currents and wind conditions and other things to show where there's a buildup. And it's very simple. It's a number scale of one to four. You can see those green lines on screen. Uh, the pale green will be your weak front. Um, I'm sorry, not one to four, but actually um, two to four. We, we got rid of the ones because it, they were a, a weak a, a front that week just wasn't effective and no need to show it on screen. So you okay. have a number scale of two to four, um, moderate, strong, and very strong. And I think you can actually click on the line when you're on the screen and it'll give you an indicator of what that is. 
Uh, yeah, and that's actually something important that um, I hadn't uh, mentioned yet is that yeah, you can um, long press on a lot of this information um, and get uh, more information about what's going on uh, in that location. So we can see, yep, this is a very right. strong plankton. So, uh, on, and a number four plankton front, for example, on a good strong number four, that's where you're going to see the water go from turpid to clear. Um, and and uh, going after the pelagic fish, the, the, the bait fish will hang out in the turpid side of the water and the, the, the pelagics will hang out on the clear side and then they'll dart into the tur turpid water to go after the bait fish. So if you can find that edge, that's where you want to be. That's where the money is. That's cool. Right. So in addition to plankton, I think we also have a couple of different ways to visualize sea surface temperature in here too. So similar to the plankton, there's a contour um, and there is a front. So I'll turn on the contours first. And these, again, just kind of look like basically like temperature isobars, right? Exactly. Good, good description. Contour lines, they're showing you what the temperature is along that line. And they're uh, shown in two degree increments. So you can see where the temperature is changing and kind of get an idea if there's a, a swirl or a pattern or, a, you know, a temperature break occurring. Um, That'll give you kind of a basic overview. And, and what we did was it, it's basically the same information that's in that comes with the offshore weather package only on the offshore weather. It shows up as a color here. It just shows up as a, a, a red line in and during shades of red, depending on what the temperature is. OK, yeah. So it makes it a little bit easier to see, because particularly if you're going to have multiple layers of things turned on and trying to find the intersections of, of key pieces of data, you know, right. it makes sense to maybe take some of the colorization out and just go with the raw the raw information. Um, and I thought this one was kind of interesting too, um, the sea surface temperature front, because it's again, kind of communicating the same information, but it instead now it's actually showing like where those key uh, right. differences are. Right. Again, this is where the oceanographers are getting involved. Um, and they're basically identifying where the best temperature breaks are. Uh, a temperature break is one of the things that we as fishermen like to find because that's, again, where there's going to be activity, where the temperature is changing. So what we're showing you here is where the most radical temperature breaks, temperature changes are occurring. Um, and it, again, it's number scale of one to four, uh, weak to strong. So you, if you can find a number three or a number four temperature front, again, this is going to be uh, you know, a high probability area for you to catch fish. That's great. And again, these um, uh, these items we're looking at, these are every 24 hours, right? Right. So that to go down the list, the, the 30 meter sub temps update daily, height anomaly updates daily, plankton, uh, sea surface temperature, uh, uh, sea surface temperature fronts update daily. However, the sea surface temperature contour information and also going back over to our offshore temperature color type temperature, how that displays on the chart, that information updates every 12 hours. And that's a change. Hmm. We used to show the information updated every three hours, but the caveat was that that was a average, a, up to a, a three to seven day average that we updated every three hours. Well, uh, NOAA launched a new satellite last year that gave us some new temperature information that is not inhibited by cloud cover. Uh, so now we're using the combination of satellites and we're getting a more rock solid sea surface temperature every 12 hours. Okay. So it's, it's every 12 hours. That one updates. Everything else is every 24 hours. And by the way, um, all of these updates are designed to come out in the wee hours of the morning. Typically, you'll see the updates come through maybe 1 a.m., anywhere from 1 a.m. Sometimes they get out towards 8 a.m., but we are try to get the information out to you basically before you're going to be leaving the dock on the East Coast. Okay. And then, um, so there's one more that we haven't talked about in here, and that is the weed lines. So let me turn that off and turn that on. And the weed lines are... are uh, I know something a lot of people swear by uh, because the weeds provide cover for the bait fish, right? And they, it's habitat for them. Well, cover or, you know, if you're a mahi fisherman, um, a shade on the water, uh, you know, where there's a shady spot. I, we've all been out there. If we found a, a, a garbage can or a, a trash can lid or a, a pallet floating, you can usually get a mahi underneath of that. So, you know, being able to get on a, on a patch of weeds is just a, a wonderful thing. Um, but weeds are tricky. 
Um, so the way that the what we're seeing here is uh, again using high resolution satellite imagery. Uh, we have a software algorithm that looks at that imagery and then pulls up possible areas. And what it's looking at is the reflectivity of the water, the reflectivity changes where weeds are congregating. So uh, the the software algorithm scans it and then it's passed over to an oceanographer and be, he basically takes his highlighter and he highlights an area that is highly probable to be weeds. And that's what we're giving you on, on screen is kind of a, a, a rough sketch of where um, some weeds are showing up. And because weeds do move around a lot and they're affected by wind, um, they break up, they sink, they disperse, uh, and current, they're affected by currents. Uh, because of all these pieces of information, uh, we put three days worth of weed line information into the feed. Um, and I believe you can see in the legend there, it shows you the different shades of color um, and giving, gives you the age of the information. It does, yeah, two day, one day, and today. Right, and you can even turn on the, the loop feature which is, which is when weeds are turned on, you have this animate weed line. So what then it does, it plays you a loop of what they've been doing for the past three days. Uh, so you can see in this example, there's a blank screen there at one point. Well, either those weeds dispersed or that could have been a cloudy day and we didn't get a shot that day. So that is one thing to consider that weed, it, weeds are inhibited by cloud cover. Okay. Um, so at least we're giving you more than one day so you can at least see where they were. And then you have to kind of put your thinking cap on and say, okay, well, I've got a current that's been running to the north. So I probably want to run north of this area if I want to really look for these weeds. Another uh, thing about weeds to know is that typically um, you we can't accurately show weeds within 20 miles of the coast. Uh, there's too much uh, surface clutter and there would be too many inaccurate reports. So we've essentially masked the area from the shore out to 20 miles and we won't be showing you any weeds in that vicinity at least not once you get uh north of i'll say palm beach down into the florida area and towards the keys um we're finding there's not as much surface clutter so we're able to push in a little closer there uh so but if you're if you're you know thinking about if you're if you never see any close to shore then that's that's the reason why is because we are, we're not showing you close to shore they would be too inaccurate yeah, I guess that makes a lot of sense because there's just so much coastal traffic to start with. I mean, the for the satellite, uh, the boats probably look like weeds. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that's another thing. You know, it it does have to be a larger patch to to be able to show up on from satellite imagery. Okay. Um, so I will say though, uh, one of the advantages of plankton fronts and temperature fronts is what I have found is a lot of times along a plankton front or a temperature front that, that will create a little rip current and you will find weeds that get trapped on that little rip current. So a lot of times you will find a weed line along a plankton front or a temperature front. Not one big enough to see from satellite, but one that's big enough to get some fish under it. Get some fish under it locally. Yeah. And that actually kind of uh, leads to an interesting part of, part of this discussion is that you know we looked at all of these layers individually but when you start bringing them together um there's actually some really good tools here for finding uh productive spots and i see a lot of the suggestions that you guys have in your training material online and you have some great stuff um uh, in the sirius xm learning library um I, I see a lot of it revolves around turning on plankton front sst front and then that 30 meter subsurface at the same time let's bring that into play just kind of an idea of what it would look like uh, with all of these layers uh, turned on. But I guess with, with those kind of key three, um, now you really have some good tools at your disposal to identify uh, some key uh, areas to fish. So with those uh, two fronts, the SST and the plankton, you're looking for those uh, like threes and fours. Yeah, if you, if you the, the, you know, the, the temperature fronts are red and the the plankton fronts are green lines. And my favorite saying is if you can get those two lines to come together, that's like Christmas, red and green. Um, if those two lines are, are running parallel to one another or intersecting one another, like you're seeing on screen there, you know, that's that's the two the two best features coming together right there for you. You've got a temperature break and you've got plankton uh, building up. You've got some turbid water and some clear water. It couldn't be better. That's a good place to look right there. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, well, let's take a look at the questions again. I've seen a few more pop in as we've been uh, chatting here. Uh, let's see what we have got. Uh, from Ryan, will fish mapping ever be something available on the Great Lakes? What yeah. do you think, Dan? 
Well, we don't know yet. Um, Maxar has never, never aimed their, their oceanographers. Uh, they are oceanographers at the Great Lakes, but, um, uh, and we started with the pelagic species. That was our first try. So uh, okay. uh, I don't have anything uh, on the current roadmap for the Great Lakes. Also the data, the type of fishing that's there, it's not quite the same. So it's going to be a little bit of a learning curve for us to, uh, to, to look at the Great Lakes. Uh, the same goes for the Pacific Northwest Territory. We've had some people asking us, what about salmon, for example? Example. And the answer is, well, not yet. We'll, we'll, we're going to, you know, we'll address that down the road. We'll take a look. But for right now, it's going to be the species that you, that we have shown. Okay. Very good. In the, uh, in the Great Lakes. So obviously there is full weather coverage there. Um, there yeah. is, and I sea think, surface temperature. You know, you yeah, still, still give you that information. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So there are some, some things to start with. Uh, from one hand or two, what benefits do you see, you two see for us guys up in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, again, we just talked about that. Uh, I've got a guy running the Pacific Northwest. He's a tuna guy, and and he is using the uh, the plankton information, and he's using the sea surface temperature, and he loves the subsurface temps as well. Um, the the weeds, uh, y'all, you don't get much uh, um, sargasso up that way. Um, and we've been asked, uh, will the kelp show up as a weed line? And it will not. Kelp's different. Um, and that's another one that's on the list to work on down the road. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, stay tuned for future updates on that. That's what's pretty cool about it, though, too, is that, you know, it, it's there's certainly things that can be, you know, added in the future. If the demand is there, you know, if there's, if there's the demand and technology and, and we don't have it, you know, let us know because anything is possible. Uh, let's see. I know it was said fish mapping was updated Tuesday and Saturday. What about everything else? Right. So, so every, Tuesday every and Saturday day. was the fishing recommendations, right? Right. Yeah. And just those. And then everything else is daily with the exception of sea surface temperature, which is even a little bit better every 12 hours. Every 12 hours. That's great. Yeah. So it is very up to the minute, you know, essentially uh, information up to the day anyway, as good as you're going to get. Yep. And it's going to work out there when you're out there too. That's the other, you know, that's the whole beauty of the satellite delivery is, is there are a lot of uh, good services that are internet based, but once you're six miles from shore, you lose cell yeah. coverage. Um, you lose that capability to pull the stuff down off the internet and get it updated. Yep. That is very key. Yeah. I think the, the satellite delivery is, is definitely awesome for those guys that are going out. Yeah. The, the internet coverage is good, but only, only when you're close enough to receive it. Uh, comment from Ron, water temp is so important and around our area, we get a lot of thermoclines, which can really affect fishing. Um, yeah, and Ron is in Florida. He's down near Palm Beach, I think, is where Ron is. And uh, there's definitely some good information uh, in there for that. Um, does the, uh, with that 30 meter, I guess that 30 meter uh, subsurface temp would pick up thermocline, at least if it's in that upper part of the water column. Right, exactly right. So it's a great tool for finding that. Uh, let's see if we can just take one, one more question. Another one in there for us. Uh, from yeah. Tim, please say we can use this in Australia also. Uh, unfortunately not, Tim. Uh, this particular uh, feature is a uh, U.S. North America thing. But, um, uh, you know, certainly if it's something that you are interested in and you have other anglers that are interested in it, uh, make your desires known there. Who knows what might be possible? <laughs> yeah. It's going to take another satellite. That's, that's a, it's, it's not easy to do. That's true. That's true. All right. Uh, all right. Sold ordering my SR 200 tomorrow. Um, well, uh, let me uh, pass on a piece of advice to you. If you are ordering an SR 200 tomorrow, make sure you either pop on to SiriusXM.com slash Marine or go on to raymarine.com onto our SR200 page. Um, there is a $175 in rebates on the SR200 right now. 100 from Sirius XM, another 75 from Raymarine. Uh, so definitely take advantage of that. Um, put a little bit, bit of uh, gas money back in your pocket so you can uh, get out there and, uh, and try it for its uh, full effectiveness. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to show you on Axiom, which I think is uh, pretty cool in Raymarine's implementation of fish mapping. Um, and that is our ability to layer this data over uh, your premium uh, fishing charts. So I have one more tile that I had kind of pre-programmed here. Um, I'm going to bring it up. It's this one here called fishing. And this one, again, is going to come up with Navionics uh, data. So we're looking at a Navionics chart uh, underneath. Um, and you can see I have some 
assorted uh, fishing layers uh, turned on. So I have um, uh, Mahi uh, turned on for fishing recommendations. We've got plankton contours, SST contours, weed lines, and it looks like we might even have satellite uh, or SST, uh, the colorized layer turned on, which actually I wasn't planning to turn that on yet, but uh, let's just take a peek here and see. You're giving away sneak previews. Yeah, sneak preview. Okay. There we go. Um, so this is uh, this is a Navionics Platinum Plus uh, chart. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Again, you can see all of my layers here all stacked up nicely. But as I continue to zoom in here, here's my uh, high definition bathymetric layer from Navionics. But again, I still have my fishing recommendations. I have my weed lines, SST contours, plankton contours. And if I come in a little more, uh, I even have my uh, bathymetric shaded relief uh, layer uh, available to me. So if I was trying to get over a wreck or an artificial reef or some other piece of structure um, that Navionics has captured, and this works um, over Navionics, over CMAP, uh, if you have Seymour or strike lines, high resolution charts, whatever your favorite is, um, you can pull this in uh, right on top of all of those uh, different types of charts. So you can see here I am in fishing mode. So I'm going to open my menu. And here my chart mode is in fishing chart as opposed to fish mapping. So that is, in this case, pulling my Navionics Platinum Plus fishing layer uh, up. Um, and then we add some additional menu items. I have this menu called Fishing Intel. And Fishing Intel is all of that fish mapping information. So neatly organize, organized into some tabs. I have um, all my different layers of information I can turn on or turn off. I have my species recommendations on the second tab. So I can turn those on or off as I want. And then I also have uh, controls for sea surface temperature. I can turn it on or turn it off and adjust the visibility here uh, as well. Um, but being able to stack all of that uh, kind of, you know, up to the minute uh, serious data on top of the fishing chart that has the structure, it has the contour lines, um, makes for a really powerful set of tools when you're out there on the fishing grounds. Yeah, you know, looking at that, I was I was blown away when I saw this on my Ray Marine unit. Um, and, and for me, being able to put the, uh, the sea surface temperature as a color and then put the subsurface fish mapping sea surface temperature uh, on, that gives you that perspective showing you the thermoclines that is just uh, exceptional. That's pretty cool. Here, let's, uh, let's do that real quick. So you said you had turned on, I'm going to go to fishing intel. Yeah, you turn on the subsurface, 30 meter subsurface. So I'm going to turn off the other ones. For a moment. Just, yep. And then I'm going to go to SST and we'll turn that on. So you, now you're looking, you can see it at what by the color, what the surface temperature is and by the, the line where there is one, what the subsurface temperature is. You okay. might be too too close inshore. You might need to yeah, zoom out. You, you also might need to adjust your, your layer information. That's the, the sea surface temperature limits. Another interesting thing that Ray Marine has done here is allow you the ability to adjust the limits on both the surface temperature and the sea surface, subsurface temperature. Okay. Yep. Uh, I'm thinking also I may have the transparency jacked up a little bit too high on it. That's probably why uh, we're not quite Seeing it here, the fishing intel, our SST layer, and let's turn that down a little bit. Maybe thin it out just a little bit. And then we get some of the lines I think will show up there. There we go, 30 meters. There we go. Yep, there they are. And again, the, the range might need to be adjusted. Jim, I don't know the how you, if you adjust the range, you can't adjust it from fishing intel. You'd have to drop back over the fish mapping screen to adjust the uh, the range on uh, oh, the temperature yeah, the limit, limit range. The temperature limit range, yeah. I might have to actually right. pop uh, just temporarily. I can actually do it right here too. Let's go to, I go to weather. I can do it right here real quick. Display data limits. Well, that was the surface temperature. I was referring to the subsurface temperature. Oh, the subsurface temperature. Sorry about that. Um, weather, back to fish. Oops. 
Wrong one. Fishing chart. There we go. Not. Yeah, so there's our 30 meter turned on. Okay. So, and I, you have to zoom in a little. What's the what's the, what are we getting seeing for a temperature there on screen on the subsurface contour line when you go full screen? Uh, so on the contour in. line, it is at seventy five degrees right here. This line is right. So you're seventy five subsurface and you're at eighty on the surface approximately. Yeah, there we go. So you're seeing that five degree temperature change from top to bottom. Yeah. Very good. All right, let's uh, let's take another look at the questions and see what we have. We're starting to come up towards the top of the hour. Uh, so if you have questions or comments, certainly please drop them in down below. Uh, so a question from Al. What is the difference between a CAM 210 and a CAM 220? All right, a CAM 210 and a CAM 220. Uh, those are our marine IP cameras. And I was actually looking to see if I have one within arm's reach. I do, but I think it's in a box that I can't get to. Um, <laughs> So those are our two marine uh, video over IP cameras. Uh, the CAM 210 is what they call a bullet style camera, uh, where the CAM 220 is a dome style camera. Uh, they both are high definition. They're used generally for either onboard monitoring, engine room monitoring, or they get used with our augmented reality system. So you can look out over the water and then you can drop uh, graphics from about AIS and waypoints and things like that uh, into the augmented reality display. Um, the CAM 210 has a narrower field of view, uh, so it's not going to be, it's not going to see as far out to the edges, but everything in it is going to look larger, uh, where a CAM 220 has a much wider uh, field of view. So it covers a lot more water, but everything in its image is going to look a little bit smaller. Um, but a lot of times the choice between one or the other comes down to really their physical size. The CAM 220 being a dome style camera uh, is a lot more compact. Um, a lot smoother. The CAM 210 is a little bit bigger. Uh, it has an adjustable mount so you can point it. Um, so if you need more information on that, let me know. Drop a comment in down below. And uh, I think we got any more questions out there? Maybe we'll make this the last call for questions. We kind of got to the bottom of the list. All right. Well, with that, we're basically uh, just about at the end of the hour. So I think we will wrap it there for tonight. Uh, D uh, Dan, thank you so much for joining us. And, My uh, pleasure. And your insights onto this uh, fish mapping product uh, in particular. It's really, really cool. I think it's uh, really going to be a game changer for a lot of marine anglers out there. It is. You know, with the cost of fuel nowadays, being able to get you on a spot where the fish are going to be a lot faster and a lot right, it's going to be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anything you can do to save a couple of gallons of gas is uh, going to be, it adds up really quickly now. <laughs> yeah, it does. All right. Well, again, for anybody um, watching this, thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you have additional questions or comments, feel free to drop them into uh, whatever platform you're watching us on. I will be in there again tomorrow and over the coming days and weeks. So I will continue to answer questions. Um, if you have something of a highly technical nature um, that isn't really suitable for a YouTube or Facebook comment and you want to drop me an email, feel free to do that as well. James.McGowan, M-C-G-O-W-A-N, at raymarine.com. And that'll come right to me. I'm happy to, uh, to look at uh, whatever it is you have and uh, give you advice on the best Raymarine solutions for your boat. So with that, we will sign off. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with our next episode. Thank you for watching Raymarine Live. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.